the world before IPAs. Can you even do that, Taplines listener? It existed. Around the turn of the century, the American craft brewing landscape was awash in amber ales, brown ales, lagers, and comparatively few versions of the Hop Forward India Pale Ales that would come to dominate the category a decade later and, for the most part, still do. The ones you could get a hold of back in like 1999 were mostly well balanced West Coast style IPAs. A continuously hopped Imperial IPA from an East Coast brewery was quite literally unheard of. And yet the nation, nay, the world, was about to hear tell of exactly that. Joining us today on Tap Lines is Sam Calagione, the founder of Delaware's Dogfish Head Brewery. He's on the show to tell us about the serendipitous Rube Goldbergian MacGyver-esque genesis of 90 Minute, the first commercially packaged Imperial IPA the world has ever known. Its 9% ABV and 90 IBUs may not sound that scandalous today, but back then it was an outrageous new foray into parts unknown for the fledgling craft brewing industry. It's Sam Calagione, it's 90-Minute India Pale Ale, it's the continuously hopped history of a beer that foretold the category's future, and it's all right here right now on Von Pear's Tap Lines. Joining Tap Lines now, it's a man who needs no introduction in the craft brewing industry, but he's going to get one anyway here on Tap Lines, the Von Pear podcast. It's Sam Calagione. The uh, co-founder of Dogfish Head, the beloved brewery in Milton, Delaware, who's joining us uh, today to take a little stroll down memory lane. Sam, welcome to Tap Lines. Tap Lines, blow away. Yes, that is going to be our new theme song. Sam, <laughs> thank you. Good to so, see you, Dave. So, likewise, always a pleasure. Uh, it's always a treat when we get to when we get to chat. And today we're going to talk about some really fun piece of Dogfish Head's history that some people know. And I think uh, at this point, there's an entire maybe generation of, uh, of new, younger drinkers, legal drinking age, of course, uh, who maybe don't know this history. So we're going we're gonna to do all that in a second. But Sam, before, before we crack into it, uh, uh, literally and figuratively, um, where are you joining us from today? I am, uh, there's a map with a tree in my background for good reason. I'm up at the spiritual home of dogfish which is coastal maine uh not, as opposed to the physical home of dogfish where we started the brewery which is in coastal delaware so greetings from uh mid coast maine near booth bay harbor where i'm looking out at a jut of land called booth uh called dogfish head maine nice and you've you vacation there for how many years at this point so my folks got a house up here, just a cabin on a, on an island with a wood stove, shoot, maybe when I was 15. So, and my dad was buying good beers like Anchor, Rest in Peace, and or we'll see what's going to happen. Yeah, and yeah. Moosehead and Sam Adams, those are the beers I was stealing from my dad's fridge, and that must have informed my decision to start homebrewing after college. And yeah. a, a, away we went, but we've had this uh, affinity for the coast of Maine uh, since my folks bought the cabin out there. And I was actually one mile from where we're sitting when I told my dad I wanted to open a, a brewery. I was on a jog with him up here, and I was an English major thought I was going to be a journalist. Uh, and uh, and he's like, I, I was taking classes in the graduate program at Columbia. He's like, how are your classes going? I was like, eh, to be honest with you, I've stopped going because I'm writing a business plan to open a brewery <laughs> after he paid for my college education. And he was quiet for a minute while he was running. And then he looked up and he pointed at a sign and said, you know what, Dogfish Head would be a good name for a brewery. So I got his okay to go on this journey and, and the name of our brewery in, in one, one fell swoop. Man, I love that. And I never forget the fact that you are an English major. I was an English major in college. I now work as a journalist, of course. So cool. uh Yeah, no, but those who don't know you may not realize that you're a man of, uh, you're a man of many talents, you're a man of letters, uh, and of course, a passionate fan and lover of music as well, in addition to being uh, one of the more innovative American brewers that is, uh, is working these days. Well, Dave, so, I got to say, my... my uh, 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 my my daughter's about to graduate next year with a journalism degree at U Miami, and my son graduated a, a, an English degree from Brown. So all you, me, and them are scared shitless about AI. <laughs> well, I'm going. I'll be going down with the ship. Uh, you can find me writing to the very last. But we're going to go down uh, a little bit of a different lane. We're going to go in a little bit of a happier direction, and sometimes. It's happy to look to the future, but oftentimes here on Taplines, uh, we enjoy our opportunities to look to the past. 
Sam, we're going to be talking today about a beer that, much like yourself, needs no introduction amongst real true uh, uh, true heads of the craft beer uh, of the craft beer landscape. But for those uh, you know who maybe again are younger and aren't as familiar, we're going to be talking about 90 minute Imperial uh, India Pale Ale Dogfish Heads, nine percent alcohol by volume, heavy hitter. Um, that is a delightful beer. Sam was kind enough, the, the folks at Dogfish Head were kind enough to send me uh, one to sample while we talk today. Sam, you've got one of your own over there, and we're going we're gonna to have a little chat about this beer and about sort of how it came about, of course, because it's a very unique story, but also what, it, what its significance was in the marketplace at that time. So let's fire up the time machine and scroll ourselves back to uh, the, the late 90s, Dogfish Head is open, of course. It's a little brew pub at that point in uh, in Milton, Delaware. 1995 uh, is when you guys first started. And th- this is not the beer that you started with, Sam. What what beers were you brewing when Dogfish Head first started up? Yeah, so when we opened up, I wrote a business plan when I was living in New York City, and the first page was this Emerson quote, which is still kind of our, our rallying cry. And then the second page I wrote, uh, Dogfish will be the first commercial brewery in America committed to brewing the majority of our beers outside the Rhine Heights Gebot, uh, incorporating culinary ingredients. So for your view- viewers that don't know the Rhine Heights Gebot, it was a Bavarian beer purity law that was enacted in 1516, 500 years ago. It said beer could only be made with malt water and hops, not other ingredients. And, uh, and that commercially became the, the de facto norm around the globe. And with craft brewing in America, we started brewing these fresh, robust, unpasteurized beers as a community in the 70s and 80s. But no one was really focused on bringing unexpected culinary ingredients into commercial brewing. And we decided that's how we would for, you know, create our little niche. So I intentionally opened our little tiny brewery within a restaurant that had an open kitchen and we used the same refrigerators and stuff to put food on the wood stove and the wood oven and the wood grill uh, as I would use those uh, same refrigerators to load them with pureed grapes or honey or raisins or maple syrup or pumpkin meat and bring them out to introduce into the brewing process. So out of the gates, our best-selling beers were beers like uh, um, Raison d'Etre made with raisins and beet sugars, uh, April hop, which I think was the first uh, fruit infused IPA, uh, was early Immort Ale, Immortal, uh, which was brewed with maple syrup from my family farm up here in New England and juniper berries. And it really wasn't until 90 minutes that we started making, you know, what would be recognized as, as IPA style. Yeah. Beer. Yeah, yeah. Chicory Stout, too, I think, if I'm Ooh. not mistaken. Right? Weren't you guys brewing? Chicory yeah. Stout it was right out yeah. of the gates, 95. Yeah. Originally, until the federal government told me I had to stop, it was brewed with <laughs> organic Mexican coffee and St. John's wort, making it America's first antidepressant depressant. <laughs> and the federal government, uh, of course, like had it. something to say about that. And uh, like it. I'm sure very, very kindly and politely told you, hey, Sam, uh, stop doing that immediately. <laughs> exactly. That's why you... Can't find St. John's Ward on the label anymore. That's right. That's right. Well, so in 1995, and of course, like towards the end of that decade, which is where we're going to focus in on in a moment, um, people were drinking very different types of beers than they are now. Anyone who has spent any time even, you know, casually strolling down the beer aisle for the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, uh, is almost, you know, sort of innately familiar with the concept of India Pale Ale. It is, of course, the craft brewing segment's longtime leader in terms of style. It's in terms of both dollars and volume. Um, it's a really just sort of juggernaut style, but that was not always the case. And if you look just a little bit further into the past, into those late 90s, what were people? What were people drinking at that time? Of course, they were starting to drink some of the dogfish head stuff that you guys were putting out. But what was? What were the popular styles? Yeah, I, I, maybe a half a decade ago, I went back and looked at 1999, the year we released 90 Minute, to look at mm. what were the most popular craft beer style categories that were kind of tracked at retail, and they were amber, pale ale, uh, seasonal. It was a generic call. Uh, right, right, know, right called seasonal uh i think those were the big three and you're right uh it's come so far like ipa wasn't even the top five when yeah. we when we started 90 minute and now i think it's like one out of every other craft beers 
made by one of the 9,000 American breweries is, is some form of an IPA. Yeah. Was brown ale still going strong at that point or had that kind of faded by then? It was, but it wasn't up there because you know, that was the era where New Belgium was on a tear. So right. Amber's numbers were high with, with their fat tire. And yep. of course, Sierra was a juggernaut. Uh, and Lager was top five because of Sam Adams. But no, even Brown Ale was probably six, seven down, down around where Porters and Stouts were. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned there in Heitzkaba and this idea of, you know, the, the purity law and this idea that beer has to be a specific type of thing made with specific ingredients and can't deviate from that. You yourself have a long history of deviating from, <laughs> from everything. Uh, you've made a, a hell of a career out of it, obviously. Off-centered is your, is part of the mantra at Dogfish Head. Um, but also you've got to run this business, right? You've got this brew pub, you're four years in, you're having success at that point, but you're also thinking about, okay, how do we grow? How do we make this work? Um, because these were still, in 1995 and 1999, there was no guarantee that craft beer was going to be a real industry ongoing. There were still people at that point who were talking about it as a fad. When you started thinking about, okay, what's the next move, you stumbled on an India Pale Ale. You stumbled on the India Pale Ale that we're drinking and a very different beer, which I think the contrast between the two, between Midas Touch mm -hmm. and 90-Minute IPA, is really instructive sort of getting into your head about what your plans were, how you saw the market shaping up. But how did you come to, to land on the India Pale Ale and the 90 Minutes specifically? So, uh, well, uh, basically to tell the 90 Minute story ahead of the Midas Touch story, but they were both like, you know, existentially important beers to dog. Agreed. Because like you, like you and, said. And to like, the industry. And to the industry. Well, yeah. That's yeah. nice. That's nice. And if, if they didn't happen, when they happened, I don't know that Dogfish would have not gone bankrupt, to be honest. Because mm. right out of the gates, our restaurant brewery was successful. You know, this little beach town in Delaware. We had this, we were packed, you know, Memorial Day through Labor Day in this beach town. And it's become a lot more year round since the mid 90s. But we were doing great as a restaurant. And then with, you know, great bravado, I'm like, wow, everyone around here really dug, digs our beer. We're the first brew pub in the first state. I want to expand. I want to start distributing coast to coast these exotic beers made with culinary ingredients. So we built a big, bigger brewery, 30 barrel brewery, 10 miles from our brew pub. And it was super inefficient. I built it out of used dairy and canning equipment that didn't really work well. So it was like for every sellable. Uh, three sellable cases of beer that came off the bottle line. One was shorties and we couldn't sell it, which is the entire profit margin. So we like pissing into the wind, trying to <laughs> grow this piece of crap brewery. And, but then in 1999, we came up with both Midas touch and 90 minute. We can talk about Midas later, but the 90 minute impetus was each morning. This is how I would, I would start the brewing water in the morning. I would go out and, and mix an iced coffee with a chicory stout from the tap. We were not open yet. And we had a uh, mattress in the cellar. So as the water was heating, I would have a half iced coffee, half chicory stout in a pint glass with ice, smoke a cigarette, camel light. It's freaking terrible, but it's true. <laughs> I'd have one cigarette to end and, and begin the day back then. I haven't smoked in 20 years, but, uh, and I'd put on a little Sally Jesse Raphael or a little, you know, morning TV and, and you know, sit there and, and chill while the water heated. And that morning I was watching some uh, culinary show. I don't know what network. If it was like a major network and they had a chef as a guest, I should have wrote it down, but I didn't. And the chef was talking about if, if he added, he was cooking with cracked pepper. And he said, if I add a little pinch of cracked pepper the whole hour that I simmer the stew, the flavor and the complexity of this black pepper will be woven in more gracefully in a nuanced, you know, in a positive way than if I had that same volume of pepper all at once. And I thought, as I listened to that, whoa, you know, maybe this is an idea I can bring into brewing because traditionally with beers, particularly IPAs, there's an early hop addition for bitterness and then one at the end for aroma. What if I just add little tiny pinches of hops the whole 90 minutes that I boil this beer? And, uh, and, and I also thought, hey, I remember being out this Salvation Army on the highway a few weeks ago. I was buying flannel shirts that the farmers locally, you know, give away. You can buy them for five bucks. And I remember seeing this thing that might work. So I went out to the highway and it was a vibrating football game that some of your our viewers might remember. And I basically MacGyvered the vibrating football game, drilled some holes in a five-gallon bucket, duct taped it with two two-by-fours going down the game. And then by the, changing the the 
angle of the game and the diameter of the holes, I figured out how to make it where it would vibrate at a certain angle where the hot pellets would be released out the bucket, down the vibrating game, into the boiling beer, because I had the, this contraption set up on a on a uh, step ladder over my five barrel brewing system. So uh, it was a, 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 an idea that I was like, I don't know if it's going to work, but it, it did. And we continue to hop the beer for nine, 90 minutes. We made it 9% alcohol and 90 international bittering units. So everything was tied to this nine theme and uh, first batch came out great. And so, man, I love that story. And I think it was, I was doing a little bit of research before this. It was uh, the, the original was the Tudor, True action electric fo- electronic football game. Listeners, you 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 can probably sort of envision what we're talking about. It's a vibrating um, like metal surface, and the little figurines. If you're using it for what it's actually designed for, which is to play the the arcade game, little figurines will move, and you can kind of you can kind of get them um, you know to advance on the field. Sam obviously Jerry rigged that into something totally different, which is is how you you know you made ninety minute. Uh, but you do quick aside here. I think Dogfish had recently did a collaboration with Tudor on a on a football game, right? Exactly. Yeah. If you go look up, you know, Tudor vibrating football, you can go to their website and get a branded with sixty minute and ninety minute vibrating <laughs> football game. And we announced like a week before the Super Bowl that Dogfish is proudly the only beer sponsor, big or small, of the uh, World Championships of vibrating football. So. Pretty, pretty intense stuff. Uh, yeah, I love that. That's a coveted, a coveted sponsorship. Uh, the electronic football uh, uh, world championships, uh, as we talk about a lot here on tap lines, of course, uh, beer endorsements are really, really vital, uh, in the sports space. So congratulations, uh, to dogfish head on locking that in exclusivity nonetheless. I mean, that's a big, that's a big spot for you, man. <laughs> Right, right. Next is blimps. Yeah, that's right. I like it. Going after all the all the primo placements. I'm in for it. Uh, so listen. So so ninety minute. You figure out how to to sort of rig up this system using uh, something from the Salvation Army and also OSHA's worst nightmare, perhaps. Uh, yeah. You know, to, to, but you 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 start to get um, you know this this beer that you're you're happy with, um, and you think, okay, cool. Like it's 1999. Uh, we're gonna zag when everyone else is zigging. This is something new and exciting that that we think uh, drinkers are really gonna respond to. You put it out in 1999. I think it is the first Imperial IPA ever to be pack- packaged for commercial sale in the United States, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know that either. But my buddy Greg Cook, who, who ran Stone Brewery, reached out to me or uh, like. A, in 20, 2000, he's like, hey, just want you to let, let you know, we thought we brewed the first Imperial IPA, but we did the research with the TTB, and 90 Minute was the first uh, l- label submitted with the word Imperial next to IPA. And he said, not even just in America, but even in England, because, you know, for, for, for sure. folks that might not be familiar with the lineage of the style, IPAs. Were certainly an English, a British invention. Imperial stouts were an English invention, but we, as Americans, came up with the Imperial IPA style. And I just thought, hey, it's going to be an IPA, but it's going to be massive in ABV and, and gravity. So I'm going to steal the language from Imperial Stout and put it in front of the word, you know, IPA. And that was uh, 90 minute. When we first released it, a lot of brewers in DC, Baltimore, and Philly, the first bottle was a 750 mil champagne bottle with a with a photo of a circus freak hammering a nail into his skull because that's how intense the hop impression was. Yeah. So I'm going around trying to sell this champagne bottle of beer called Imperial IPA, nine <laughs> percent alcohol. That's five times the hops of even normal normal uh, craft beers. And a bunch of the local brewers in the cities around us started calling Dogfish Head the one and done brewing company because <laughs> no one would ever have a second beer after a, a pint of ninety minutes. Yeah. Yeah. That's hilarious. So you, so you, you've got the, you've got the beer. You're packaging it in the 750 milliliters, uh, which is even at that time uh, a really unusual package. Obviously, there would be a time where you'd start to see more bombers. You'd start to see more magnums coming out in the craft yeah. brewing industry. But uh, that's still an unusual package, um, and it's this, you know, to the American drinking public at that time, even though Imperial IPA now is very much in the lexicon, even for casual drinkers, uh, this is an unfamiliar, unusual beer. Sam, how did it go at first? 
Well, like I said, they're calling us the one and done brewing company. I really <laughs> But those were just your competitors. How was how are drinkers responding? <laughs> friendly competitors, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, you know, what what you know, what we always my wife always ran Dogfish social media and she's great at it. I was sort of the analog face of the company and like you, I'm a storyteller and English major. And so for me what I would the thing I was really looking forward to was opening New York City market which I did in like 98 and I would drive my pickup truck up there with two pallets of beer. I would drop them up the distributors, visit some great craft beer joints, but then I would knock on the doors of, you know, food and wine magazine, um, um, you know, uh, let's see up there, Esquire, GQ. Sure. All the men's magazines. Yep. Yep. Bon Appetit. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Bon Appetit. And so, I would knock door to door and I'd say, I got cold samples. Can I come in at four o'clock and just host a happy hour for you guys and talk beer? And, uh, you know, three out of five times, usually they'd say yes. So the yada, yada, yada is we bought the equipment to fill champagne bottles, mostly for Midas Touch, which is a beer, right. wine, hybrid, and ancient ale that we're talking about. I was like, ah, I bought all this expensive used equipment from California. Let's do a second beer when we release Midas Touch. It's a beer wine hybrid, might as such. Let's just do the crazy 90 minute, the thing we made with the continual hopping device, and away we went. Um, and then, like three months after we launched it, first, might as touch was getting all the love from national media as the ancient ale that we brought back from the dead. And, and that was, we were on today's show, right. and Food and Wine. But then Esquire named 90 Minute uh, the best uh, IPA and best beer in America, I think. And it was awesome moment uh for us and really did then the beer publications wrote about esquire writing about it and it became this this thing that i think would be hard dave to replicate in this moment where print media wasn't something that people were the back then it was it was really meaningful to get a, a hit like that totally yeah that's a much more powerful press hit in 1999 than it is even 10 years later forget about 24 years later um, you know, yeah. social media barely, in fact, didn't really exist at that time. But to the extent that it did, it was forums and message boards and, uh, you know, he, communities would gather uh, because they had like minded interests. And that was, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, uh, that was part of where 90 Minute first really kind of found its its traction. Right. I mean, you guys got. Uh, a lot of love yeah. from I, I th- it was either it must have been Beer Advocate at the time, right? Uh, which one was yeah. it? Yeah, Beer Advocate. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would say like uh, what what uh, Spinx was to TikTok, you know, ninety minute was to Beer Advocate. <laughs> <laughs> wow! <I> Sam Calagione <laughs> has the pop culture range, people. <laughs> That is that is a uh, that is an SAT analogy for the ages. <laughs> <laughs> and for a slim niche yeah, of college kids. Right. But but seriously, I was out mowing my lawn, and as I mentioned, Mariah ran our social media and our website communications. She yells out the window to me with my son, like attached to her in a baby Bjorn. She's like, "Hey, these two brothers run the biggest beer you know beer lovers website where they just do reviews of beers." And 90 Minutes, the best rated beer on their website. They'd love to do a, an interview with you. I remember like mowing the lawn, like stopping and being like, these guys are trying to make a living running a website about beer? Oh my gosh, I definitely want to talk to them. <laughs> so away away we went. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and what, was cool, what was cool, David, in that era, you know, the beer, there wasn't like an untapped. There wasn't really a network of social media connection. And to beer and so what happened is when they did that interview and beer lovers coast to coast saw 90 minutes was the best rated beer on beer advocate retail stores across the country beer bars across the country little startup mom and a pop you know two vans distributing companies around the country just started reaching out to our little brewery in delaware hey where can i get your beer in madison wisconsin where can i get it in portland oregon and it really helped us set yeah. up our distribution network to go coast to coast Man, that's so you know? crazy to I mean, obviously it's a fantastic beer, of course, and it is in the, you know, sort of American craft beer pantheon. It's canonical, I think. But even so, it's just so crazy, like at that that was still possible. Well, now, obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, this idea that like one beer can put you on the map, can help you start setting up uh, a far-flung distribution network, can can really kind of like 
you know, forget being the one and done brewery, you, you know, became sort of that set dogfish on the course to become the brewery that, uh, that it would, would, you know, go on to be and, and grow into today. And it's like, it, it, that's just like, I, I, as you look back at that, Sam, like not to denigrate the beer at all, which like I said, is fantastic, but like, do you, do you, how much of this do you feel like was like just incredibly lucky timing? I think that's definitely a part of it where you look at, I don't think anyone in that era would have envisioned a world where the majority of craft beer in America was some iteration of the IPA style. Um, you know, when we had German companies building us massive brewing tanks, they right. saw the amount of hops we were putting in our beer and they're like, that's irresponsible. We're not going to build tanks that can take that much hops. And they made me sign off a waiver that said, I agree that these tanks shouldn't have the amount of hops. It was just like the world was not, the world was not where it is today with a sort of loophole and threat, you know, threshold shift that our palates have collectively, you know, uh, navigated. And uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I think some of it was, I'm not sure if luck as much as it was just like, good listening, like, you know, translating that cooking show into beer and then, you know, seeing that wine drinkers were looking at craft beer and, and liked the intensity of flavor, but more approachable pricing of a, a champagne bottle of beer than certain wines. Uh, it was, it was, uh, definitely kismet, I'd say is uh, more than luck. Good, good, good timing, I guess. Well put. Let's talk a little bit more about, I mean, obviously the cooking show was the inspiration for the method that you used for 90 Minute, um, but you've had a long career of incorporating culinary techniques into the way you brew and, and you know, viewing beer as an agricultural product, as a culinary product, was sort of core to the ethos that, uh, you know, you set out to, to brew with dog head, Dogfish Head and, and, of course, your other peers at the time. How did that sort of shape the path that Dogfish Head was on? I mean, nowadays we don't necessarily think of craft beer as culinary because it's just craft beer. We know it. Like, there's no reason to call it it's like something else because it's just craft beer. It's very familiar to the American consumer base. But uh, based on sort of my awareness of it when I was, you know, uh, started, you know, getting into craft beer in the late aughts, was that there was it was still a very useful point of comparison. I would love to un, like hear you unpack that a little bit because you were on that tip, you know, ten, ten years prior, uh, all the way back when you were fifteen years prior, all the way back when you first started Dogfish Head. Why was the culinary comparison yeah. so so important or useful at that time? I think be because it was such a unique uh, perspective as for a commercial brewery mm. in the mid nineties, and you know. My coworkers, Mark Safrick, Jake, our brewers from Delaware, just in, were just hanging out with a bunch of brewers from around the country. The, the, our friend Matt and the gang at the Vale Brewery down in Richmond. I know you're from that neck of the woods. That's right. Too. That's right. So we're great friends with those guys, and uh, and they invited us down to the festival they had this weekend. And we had a blast, and you know, I'd say the majority of the beers at the different booths had some culinary ingredients in them, and that's a beautiful thing. But when Dogfish was starting. There was no one. I mean, I, I can think of Anchor Steam's Christmas Ale had spruce tips in it. And, sure. you know, maybe uh, Sam Adams would do a seasonal, like a land, cranberry lambic. But no one was focused on culinary ingredients. So that's why we really leaned into making sure it was part of our branding off-centered message that our exploration of goodness was a, a culinary agricultural exploration, not just a beer traditional recipe uh, you know, uh, exploration. And you, you mentioned, Dave, you know, today you don't hear that as much. And that's very much true. Like, for example, we were one of the first craft distilleries to open in America. We built our first distillery over two decades ago. And on our canned cocktails, which we've been working on the recipes for over 20 decades, and canned cocktails is now a really fast-growing part of our business. But we actually write on the, on the canned cocktail, Culinary Crafted, and we've learned that the younger drinker today doesn't need to hear that. Like you said, mm. they kind of grew up with, with interesting flavors, unexpected combinations of fruits and ingredients. So as we move to evolve our packaging, we're actually going to take off culinary crafted because it's uh, unnecessary. It's like people know if, 
dogfish is brewing something with, you know, recognizable fruits, herbs, and spices. It's part of their history that it came from the inspiration of a global view of ag and, 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 and creativity, a chef's creativity, just liquid creativity. Man, the fact that that's a given now has to be somewhat edifying for you, right? I mean, that's incredible that, you know, to see that over the course of your career, it now just becomes part of the visual vernacular, the, the lexicon. People just understand Dogfish Head and other, you know, peer breweries from that time as innately culinary to the point where you don't even have to say it. Yeah, and, and, you know, we're proud, you know, if you look at kind of the timeline of when that was our focus, but we're equally proud of all the, uh, you know, American indie craft breweries who have embraced a broader definition of, of beer. You know, we just recently re- re- released a beer called Bodegoza with our pals uh, at, at Talea Brewery in Brooklyn. And in sure. their brewery, it's, it's two women that own it. And part of their mission is to bring people that are uncomfortable with craft beer you know, stereotypes into the world of beer. And for example, for them, their best selling uh, flight is fruited sours because they'll challenge anyone that comes sure. to the building. If they, you know, you don't, you think you don't like beers, try these. If you like cocktails, you might like this one. If you like white wine, you might like this one. So those culinary ingredients, I think really help us, especially in this moment where young legal drinking age people, probably some of them are rebelling against what their parents had in their fridge. And that now could be Sierra Nevada Pale, Dogfish 60 Minutes, Sam Adams Lager. But if they grew up on the era of seltzer and and canned cocktails, beers that have these culinary influences could get them to consider craft beer for the first time, the younger drinkers. It's a great point. It's something, you know, a lot of, uh, a few different folks in the industry who I trust very much to, to have their finger on the pulse like you do, like Bart Watson, for example, at the Brewers Association, er, earlier in 2023, he was presenting somewhere in New England, I want to say, and that was the point that he made was, you know, younger drinkers are entering the their drinking journey at different points besides craft craft has a lot to craft beer has a lot to offer them but no longer is this the gateway no longer is this the necessarily going to be the default way they uh they sort of strike off on their on their higher quality you know drinking journey and i think like you know your point about the these culinary ingredients being uh uh you know really attractive and sort of simpatico with like a lot of the um, the things that those consumers are looking for, I think, is is well taken and is hopefully um, one that uh, all craft breweries, all 9,700 of them <laughs> across the country are taking close note of because it definitely uh, it definitely rates. Sam, I want to take a yeah. look back. You know, we we have the benefit of hindsight, of course. You were kind enough to bring us to 1999 and, and talk about, uh, um, you know, how 90 Minute came to be. But now we have, you know, re-entered the present tense here. And uh, for those listeners who have made it this far, you probably already know this, and Sam's too humble to toot his own horn here, but um, there are some accolades along the way that I think are are relevant specifically to the conversation about culinary, uh, uh, you know, adjacency of beer or, or of craft brewing as a culinary pursuit. I'm talking uh, on one hand about uh, the your your long dalliance with the James Beard Foundation. Um, Sam was nominated seven times uh, for a James Beard Award before finally and deservedly winning in 2017 uh, for the Outstanding Wine Spirits or Beer Professional uh, uh, from the James Beard Foundation. So that was a, a big moment, and I think uh, I remember you know covering it at the time or reading about it at the time, and I think like a, a validation of, of a lot of what you had been working towards, not only with 90 Minute, with Midas Touch, with all of these other beers you know that we've talked about over the course of the conversation. The other thing I want to bring up is the fact that the Tudor uh, True Action football table, uh, the electronic football table that you first used uh, to to hop uh, those first batches of 90 Minute is now in the Smithsonian, uh, the Smithsonian uh, National uh, Museum in Washington, D.C. They've got um, the, uh, what is it called? It's like the American Brewing History Initiative, I think, run by Teresa McCullough. So, Sam, like, you know, obviously you don't set out to do these things. You're not chasing awards necessarily, and you're not chasing, uh, uh, be- being entered into the permanent collection at the Smithsonian. Um, but you, you did do those things. Um, it's really obviously very impressive. Like I said at the top, uh, you know, you're one of the more innovative brewers, I think, that's working today. And you've made a huge mark on the industry. And 
it didn't exactly start with 90 Minute, but that was one of the key early wins you had. I'd like, yeah. this is a long, long windup for my question, which is we've talked a lot about what this beer means to Dogfish Head, means to the industry, um, and means to American drinkers. What does it mean to you? It means intensity. I mean, you know, I, I drink Sea Quench and 60 Minute and Citrus Squall more frequently to 90 than 90 Minute now. And maybe that wasn't the case when I was 30 and making it. But when I, I drink 90 Minute, it is kind of a liquid time capsule. Like for me, it's like for me, it's like the, the most like like homage. Like I see this music video of the last 25 years of my life that starts with the smoke clearing and the hair metal video with that first 750 <laughs> mil, that first 750 mil bottle of 90 minute. It really, it really was the first moment that gave me faith that Dogfish could make a national impact on the, on the beer community. Before that, we were just kind of throwing at the shit, shit at the wall and trying to do something really, you know, punk rock esque and, and stand out in a already semi crowded field 600 breweries back then not 9700 9, so that was like a, a really critical moment you know when i think of like probably five or six moments of of on the professional side coming up with nick 90 and midas at the same time was the start i would say coming up with sequench ale uh was uh equally like critical in my view of amazing moments and then as you mentioned you know getting our our, our continual hopping invention into the into the uh, smithsonian winning a james beard award those would be four and i'll have to think hard if there's a, a fifth uh, but those, those were huge those were huge <laughs> well you let us if you think of another one you're always welcome back on the show before before we go uh i want to talk about another invention that is not specifically uh, involved in the 90-minute uh, creation, but is very, very synonymous with Dogfish Head and with your uh, your sort of mad tinkering, your MacGyvering um, down in Milton, Delaware. I'm talking about Randall the Enamel Animal. Uh, for a lot of, again, a lot of craft beer uh, newcomers, who are coming to the industry for the first time over the course of the past five years may not be a familiar phrase, but as a way to pique their interest, Sam, as a way to maybe queue up uh, round two of Sam Calagione in the future, if we could be so lucky here at Taplons, tell us a little bit about Randall the Enamel Animal. Take us out on a, on a, on a high note. Tease it a little bit. <laughs> sure. So I th if you uh, Google search Randall Dogfish Head, we've now, with our friends at AC Beverage, designed the ultimate, like, Randall, and basically it's a it's a contraption we invented that you put anything you want in the chamber. Sounds like a bong, but it's not. It looks and, like uh, a bong too. Yeah, it's it vaguely so bong like. Yeah, yeah. It, but but bong esque, <laughs> yeah, bong esque. Right. Uh, and uh, and but basically, when you feed fresh beer out of a tap through the Randall towards the pint glass, it kind of goes between the the tap and and your pint glass. The natural alcohol in your beer uh, acts as a solvent and it pulls whatever natural you know essential oils on what are whatever or flavors are whatever you've loaded that chamber with so uh originally for us that was whole leaf hops but we've put uh you know sour patch kids coffee licorice root uh vanilla beans uh, so cocoa nibs, so lots of things. But I first developed it because we did, had an East Coast versus West Coast competition in, in around 2002 when Dogfish, you know, 90 Minute was really just coming out of the gates and things like uh, Pliny for my buddy Russian River. Sure, the uh, Chalurza. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And our, our buddies uh, at, at Adam Avery and Vinny and Tommy Arthur. So, you know, again, through Beer Advocate and just early social media, we're like – decided to have a competition. So a bunch of East Coast brewers took a bunch of West Coast brewers on at Brick Skeller, which was the first sort of craft beer OG, uh, you know, Mecca in DC. And I was like, oh shit, I know these guys are going to bring some good stuff. I better come up with something. And I was at a scrapyard and I found a bunch of, you know, stainless steel food grade metal <laughs> stuff stuck together. And I was like, wait a second, that valve here, this valve here. And we, uh, again, my MacGyver together, this machine that allowed you to kind of dry hop in real time as you were serving the beer. 
that's how Randall was born. But one time I was taking a Randall uh, through an airport and I was on a, a cell phone with Mariah and I put it through security and I had it in one bag, in one in one part of my bag, uh, a, 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 a Ziploc of whole leaf hops. And on the other side of my bag, I had this chamber <laughs> contraption. And all of a sudden they had dogs around me. They brought me in a secret room in the Philly airport. And they're like, you're going to jail for at least a year with how much pot you're on you. <laughs> I'm like, it's not pot. And they're like, bullshit. They're holding the whole leaf hops in their hands like this is pot. And they, I guess they do some tests where they burn it and they can see that it doesn't have THC. But it, it was a pretty stressful hour. I was on the, I was on the cusp of a cavity search, I think. <laughs> That reminds me, we had a uh, we had Dave Burkhart, the recently retired historian at Anchor Brewing Company, who worked very closely with Fritz for three decades, yeah. uh, and he tells a story of Fritz driving around uh, the Bay Area with a bag of hot baggy of hops on his passenger seat. But in Fritz's case, he was trying to get arrested to drum up attention for using whole leaf hops at anchor it never worked though dave burkhardt said he never got uh he never got caught by the authorities so uh you were a little (laughs) bit less lucky than uh fritz maytag the godfather of uh, american craft beer but nonetheless whole leaf hops look a little bit like uh like marijuana enough enough to law enforcement uh to 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 take you into the back room at the philly airport (laughs) i'm guessing the city of you know, San Fran and Hate Ashbury, right. they, they'd seen garbage bags full of stuff like that before <laughs> well, and were non plus. Yeah, that's exactly right. Burkhart, Dave Burkhardt said that, like, it, the hardest thing in the world would be to get arrested in San Francisco in 1971 for marijuana. It's just not going to happen. You know? <laughs> All right. Uh, that's a great story. Uh, Sam, thank you so much for joining us for Tap Lines. Thank you for, for the 90 minute, of course, and for the stories. Uh, my last question for you is, you know, you're, you're, you're now you've reached, I would say a pinnacle, if not the pinnacle of what can happen with an American craft brewery, obviously in 2019 dogfish head and uh, Boston beer company, uh, become one. Um, you've got more resources at your disposal than, than you've ever had in your career. I'm guessing, uh, you know, you've, uh, uh, Dogfish Head is not only producing beer, but is producing canned cocktails, has the distillery, has the, uh, uh, the hotel. Um, you've got all these things going on. It's, it's not the slapdash, uh, fly by the seat of your pants operation that it once was in 1995 or, or 1999 when you first came up with 90 minute. Do you miss the, the tinkering? Do you miss going to the scrapyard and picking up, uh, an old rusty, uh, or an old, uh, a football table or whatever? And, uh, and and coming up with something uh, fun to do with no, it? No, I'm, wa- uh, I'm walking out here to show you something because the, the reason I say no is we're still, like, uh, you know, letting our freak flag fly with small batch brewing. Like, as I told you, I'm at our cabin here at Dogfish Head. The namesake. It's got two yeah, little yeah, cabins. Yeah. And, and if you can see up there, if you look up there, there's the window to the bigger cabin. Yep. And it's got a little tiny two-barrel brewery that we I installed in <laughs> You see the brewery in the in the window? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that that little system built into the cabin here, the tanks are filled with a beer mead hi- hybrid brewed with uh, spruce tips from Colorado and Maine honey. Uh, so I, it feels just like when we open. We're as experimental as we've ever been, and that's what gets me. I'm proud to be an officer of a public company. I'm proud of everything Boston beers achieved and dogfish, but you know, having so many coworkers that are passionate about the recipes first, and then how are we going to sell them second is what gets me up every day. Well, very impressive, my man. I, uh, one day, maybe I hope to come bother you and your family on Dogfish Head. Only if I'm invited, of course. And uh, I'll be looking for, uh, for maybe a pint of whatever you got going on in the two-barrel system. <laughs> Open invitation, Dave. Thank you so much, Sam Calagione. We, we, you're welcome anytime on Tap Lines. And uh, enjoy the rest of your vacation, my friend. Thanks, thanks. And thanks for just being such an awesome evangelism for the brewing movement, uh, Dave. So thank you very much. You stop it. No compliments for me on my own show. It's humiliating. (laughs) (laughs) Tap Lines is recorded in Richmond, Virginia, and produced by yours truly and Darby Seaside, who, along with the talented Shane Farrick, composed our delightful soundtrack. Just listen to it. 
I also want to give a quick shout out to the entire Vine Pair team, and especially co-founders Adam Teeter and Josh Mallon, Editor-in-Chief Joanna Sherino, Managing Editor Tim McCurdy, and Art Director Danielle Grinberg, who designed our lovely Taplines logo. And of course, a big thank you to you, yes you listener, for spending time with us week in and week out. We literally couldn't do this without you. I'm Dave Infante, and I'll catch you next time.